Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. That was the tiniest little sneeze yes. I've ever heard. Thank you. <laughs> it's so delicate <laughs> compared to my personality. <laughs> You're listening to Make Some Noise Podcast, episode number 550 with guest, Dr. Adrian Udim. Welcome to Make Some Noise Podcast, your guide for strategies, tools, and insight to empower yourself. I'm your host, Andrea Owen, global speaker, entrepreneur, life coach since 2007, and author of three books that have been translated into 18 languages and are available in 22 countries. Each week, I'll bring you a guest or a lesson that will help you maximize unshakable confidence, master resilience, and make some noise in your life. You ready? Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I just deleted an intro where I talked about pumpkin spice for way too long, but what I wanted to convey, (laughs) and I got way too verbose, was that it's pumpkin spice season, and if you're a huge pumpkin spice woman or person, I see you. I'm not so much. I, I I do like a good pumpkin spice flavored thing but yeah it, I'm, I'm just not I'm not uh I'm not super committed but I love that I love the season I love fall I love living in North Carolina in the fall it's so pretty the weather is not um so sweaty in all of my crevices so I like it a lot better I love fall I wanted to let you know before we get into today, today's interview oh I edited this podcast uh, at least the uh, like the main interview part. So that little tiny snippet intro that you heard, which is usually something smart that my guest says, I decided to use that little outtake of me and Dr. Adrian. So if there are any like glaring mistakes in the audio you're about to hear, that's my fault. Sorry, <laughs> I did my best. It is quite, quite a labor to do that. My hat's off to my normal producer, Darlene, who does such an excellent job. It's it's quite it's quite a thing over here on the, the technical side. But I hope that you love it. I Dr. Adrian's work is her book Hungry for More is so important all these hungers that we have. But before before we get into that, I'm getting ahead of myself. I have a very special and specific offer coming up that is going to apply to a specific group of you. And I don't mean to be vague and insert dramatic music. But if you're not on my email list, you might want to get on it. AndreaOwen.com slash free. And you also get a secret podcast series, four episodes long. Me being your favorite professional hype girl, your big sis. And you cannot get this podcast series anywhere else, except if you sign up for that. AndreaOwen.com slash free. And that'll get you my emails, and I'm going to send out this specific offer very soon. So I'll see you over there on those emails. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Adrian. for those of you that don't know who she is. Dr. Adrian Udom is a physician, author, TEDx speaker specializing in medical weight loss and clinical nutrition. Her mission is to transform our relationship with food, our weight, and our bodies to one that is informed and empowered, inspiring people to live more physically and emotionally fulfilling lives. Dr. Udom currently sees patients in her private practice in Beverly Hills. Her book, Hungry for More, Stories and Science to Inspire Weight Loss from the Inside Out, explores the emotional and spiritual hungers that present as a hunger for food validating universal experiences through story and science. So without further ado, here is Dr. Adrian. Dr. Adrian, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you, Andrea. I am too. I have I have many questions for you and your book is so chock full of 
information that that touches on so many important topics that I know that my audience is going to be interested in hearing. So I I want to I want to jump in and but I, I want to sort of start from the beginning because correct me if I'm wrong you started out as a doctor who mostly worked with patients who were trying to you to lose weight for medical reasons. So what brought you to write this book that isn't totally really about weight loss? Right, absolutely. And uh, I still do that work. And um, yes, so I'm I am a very doctory doctor, like I, I like to say it, a uh-huh. white coat doctor in the office treating patients uh, for weight loss. But, you know, all the while, while I sp- spoke to patients, it always occurred to me that while we were suppressing hunger with medications and diets and all the sort, that there was kind of this other underlying hunger that was in the room, a spiritual hunger, like I, I like to call it, or an mm-hmm. emotional hunger that really was wanting to make itself known, that was not intended to be suppressed, and really was the place in which I felt uh, people needed to go in order to understand what hunger or void they were trying to fill. And these stories, Andrea, kept coming back over and over and over again. And you know, when something happens in that way, it's clear that it's not just me or you, but it's universal. And for mm-hmm. that reason, I felt that it was very important to share those stories, to really underscore and validate the universality of what we are longing for, what we are hungry for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, I think almost every chapter has a story from one of your patients in there, how you sort of lay out and give the example of of what it is to you know to make the point. And I I want to actually that being said, I want to read an excerpt. Like this is one of my favorite things that I read and I think it's like part of the introduction. And it's it's a it's a solid paragraph. So please hold. I always think it's so I don't know how you, if you feel about this if you feel this way, but I love it when people like read my work and then I'm like that is well, so smart. Well, I was just going to say, Andrea, I love that you're excerpting. Thank you. I am. From the start, <laughs> from the get-go, I highlighted it because I'm like, I want people to hear this. But it it dove- dovetails nicely for what you just said and really, really, I think, speaks to it. So you said, given my privilege to talk to patients from my living room. So you were talking about the, pan- the pandemic and how kind right. of everything changed. Right. You said, given my privilege to talk to patients from my living room in the midst of such trying circumstances, I was reminded that hunger is universal. Hunger for certainty, self-acceptance, belonging, and connection is a universal human experience. Life and circumstance, be it sickness, divorce, abuse, trauma, hardships, both big and small, will upend us again and again and again and reveal our hunger. Unfortunately, we are not taught to understand this hunger not nor are we allowed to tolerate it we are not taught to embrace ourselves in times of need we are not taught that there is no shame in feeling fear and longing rather we are conditioned to swallow them we liken our hunger to an affliction a scarlet letter that inadvertently exposes our humanity that was just so beautifully said i was like oh Thank yes you. <laughs> can you can you say can you say more about that just I think the thing that jumped out at me the most is the conditioning that we've, that we've all experienced. I think, especially as women, like we're taught more so to take care of everybody else's needs and desires and wants. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, that's how it was intended and hearing you read it, it stands out to me as well, that ironically, the the suppressing, the squashing, the swallowing, the not allowing and permitting is what perpetuates the hunger. Whereas if we could be allowed to lean into what it is that vexes us, right? And what it is that pains us and embrace it wholeheartedly, it, it one serves as an opportunity to mm-hmm. give ourselves what we truly need. And second, we obviate what would happen otherwise, which is in the absence of addressing that need, we continue to have that itch, that yeah. longing, that prodding to, to fill it. So we're backwards in our culture and in our society because we are taught to be ashamed 
of what it is that we long for mm -hmm. as opposed to be open hearted towards it and and use it as an opportunity that the invitation that it could present itself as yeah you saying that makes me think of the women's circles that i have been in mostly in my experience has been when i facilitate a group and the magic, I don't have really any other word except to use the word magic that happens energetically when you are in a room full of like-minded spirits, like-minded souls, and you talk about these universal truths, these universal pains that we all have to varying degrees. And some people describe it a little bit differently, but like everyone nodding their head and everyone just sort of ha having the opportunity to exhale and I know I've said it a million times here on the show, that type of camaraderie, community, just witnessing of one another is magic. It can move mountains. Like it, it's, it's not about fixing each other it, necessarily. It's just like you said, like leaning into it instead of putting on a mask, swallowing it, feeling ashamed of it and carrying that around. Like there's, I feel like, in all of the healing work there is to do, that is such a monumental piece of it is being in community and knowing that other people struggle the same way. Well, it is that common humanity piece, right? Because people do feel so alone, mm -hmm. isolated in these things. And when you can shine a light on the fact that all those people that you may admire, doesn't it doesn't take away from what makes them admirable mm -hmm. really. mm -hmm. if anything actually it makes them more admirable that they could stand in their uh, limitations and, and still be who they are but when we really acknowledge that common humanity piece I think it allows us further allows us to have permission mm -hmm. to feel those things without shame and that's really valuable that's yeah. really important it's what to me that's like the theme of the book so we're going to take a quick ad break and when we get back i'm going to talk to you about one of the first chapters that you wrote around self-love <laughs> Shopify has already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle-tested solution. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash noise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash noise to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash noise. You know when you're listening to a song on the radio and you get the profound feeling that the song playing was written about you? Now imagine having the power to gift that same incredible feeling to someone you love with an original song from Songfinch that actually is written just for them. Songfinch lets you create an original radio quality song inspired by your own life and the people you love. It's completely unique, personal, and lasts forever. Whether your song is for Father's Day, an upcoming graduation, wedding, or anniversary, or even just a gift to show your loved one how much you care, start your song now to lock in one of Songfinch's top artists. I gifted Songfinch to myself, a song about my late father, and I'm so excited to play you a clip. Flipping through the slides of learning how to live and how to love And coming undone a father-daughters without So she writes it down one of my clients heard about Songfinch from this podcast, and so she had a song created for her son who is graduating, and she told me that they both cried when she played it for him and that it exceeded her expectations. For a limited time, Songfinch is letting our listeners upload their song to Spotify for free so you and the lucky person you gift it to can listen to it anywhere, 
anytime. Go to songfinch.com slash noise and start your song. After you purchase, you'll be prompted to add Spotify streaming for your original song for free, a $50 value. Again, my URL is songfinch.com slash noise. Don't forget to share your song with us too. songfinch.com slash noise. Okay, so I want to start with a chapter. It was like, I think one of the first five or something about self-love where you talk about how, and specifically, I want you to, I would love for you to talk about how detrimental fat shaming is as well as talk to us. These are kind of two different questions. Talk to us about what is body dysmorphic disorder? So, you know, body dysmorphic disorder has very specific criteria, um, but I I think that we all experience, uh, and let's not say all, but many, many, many of us Mm -hmm. (laughs) experience shades of that, which is this overall discomfort with our bodies that leads to a hyper-focus as well as a unrealistic view of of what is. So, So there's this component of exaggeration or rather like a mismatch between what we perceive and what the reality really is. And I speak to this in the book where when I say um, I was just as judgmental, I don't know that I use the word judgmental, but kind of disenchanted with myself at a size two as I was at a size 10, which speaks to the the never enoughness Mm -hmm. that we experience with our bodies. And, you know, fat shaming kind of piggybacks on this to some degree because our society has offered up these images that are so unrealistic, Mm -hmm. so unattainable. And in wanting to pursue that image that is before us, over and over again and and it's getting better you know this this used to really be very very slowly I feel like (laughs) well absolutely but at least we're talking about it right exactly I think before there was never an acknowledgement that this was going on and so we were just suffering silently at least Mm -hmm. there's words to to discuss it so it's really so these things do go hand in hand. And it is important to to call it out and to talk about it and to say that we are all different shapes and sizes and that those things, those differences can be celebrated without shame. Uh, well, and I think, I think that's the chapter where you talk about the story of the woman who came into your office with her mother and the, the, the younger of the two had just had a baby and her mother was hyper fixated on her her adult daughter's body is that correct you know a lot of these mother daughter scenarios are kind of mirrors you know mm-hmm. the daughters are really mirrors to what the the moms have experienced and and again this is not judgment of the mother either you know as yeah. a mother i can appreciate that and i also want to say andrew there's like there's a balance right i mean there is a balance in this whole dance and i think we have to um, we have to be mindful also of how, and I know this is kind of a segue from your question, but mindful of also how we're using food, mm-hmm. you know, and it's not about so much the end result, although that's what we're focused on as women and as a society, but how we're using the food, what that is trying to soothe. Mm-hmm. And when we do that, what opportunity we're missing and so as a physician that really does deal with weight loss, I don't shy away from that either. I don't want my patients shaming themselves. I want them to meet themselves where they're at. Mm-hmm. I think it's very important also, though, to be very frank about how and where we're using food to our detriment. Yeah. Not because of how we look, but because of the misuse. And yeah. again, what is underlying that? And so I think there's this counter fat shaming towards those who are actually wanting to address this issue, who are actually wanting to seek help. You know, I mentioned in my TED talk, studies show that 
nearly 50% of Americans gained weight during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They didn't gain weight because they were celebrating themselves. They gained weight. 70% of women engaged in heavy alcohol use yeah. during this time. Mm -hmm. So it is just another shape, another form of self-soothing. And when they come to me as a weight loss physician, they know what they're coming to. It's not, and nobody's twisting their arm. They come willingly, wantingly recognizing this relationship with food is not to their advantage anymore, mm -hmm. right? But we have now this counterculture of, of why do you want to lose weight? Embrace your body. And what I'm saying is, why can't we do both? Mm -hmm. Why can't we embrace ourselves and yet know that there's a place in which there's an opportunity to grow, to improve, to explore. Mm -hmm. We can hold those two things at the same time without demonizing or, or fat shaming those who actually are seeking a different way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a complicated topic, I think for sure. And there's, there's lots of different opinions. There's so much research that I think sometimes changes over time. I have a, my undergrad is in exercise physiology and I graduated in 2009 and the research back then was different than, than it is now. So I don't pretend to be any kind of expert. And yeah, I mean, I was one of those people that, that, and also got sick over the pandemic. So there was, there was that factor too. I got an autoimmune disorder and and um, so I, I understand, and and food for me, mine's always been like booze and men has been the things that I was using recklessly. And your book outlines many of the things I was actually hungry for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't those things, but yeah, during the pandemic, food became became one of those things, and it became a habit that every single night I was eating way too many Oreos every single night. Yeah, like cow's milk and Oreos. And it was, it worked until it didn't. I'll tell you what, I looked forward to that every single night. It was delicious for a long time. And then my body started to say, you know, and I'm in my late forties now, my body said, um, no, thank you. Like we, we just can't, it might be delicious in your mouth, but it's not delicious in your body anymore. And, and I'll tell you what, cutting out processed sugar like that was one of the things that made a world of difference in just how I felt. I mean, like my joint function, my sleep, like so many different things. And I, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but like I, my point is part of my point is like, I didn't want to quit. I was like, no, nope, I'm going to just do this. And it, it had to get to the point where I knew it was really hurting me. And, you know, I have um, one of my values is around trust and like tr really trusting myself. And part of that was trusting my body and that my body was trying to tell me something. I've had so many instances where I've walked away from that and just abandoned my own, mm. my own self, my own intuition, my own inner knowing, usually around relationships and things like that. But for this one, it it was, it was around what I was putting in my body to try to self-soothe. And so anyway... Part of why I tell that story is for anyone listening, I see you and I still do love double stuffed Oreos every once in a great while. <laughs> and I will say, say this too, they don't taste as good now as they did then. <laughs> no, they don't. You know, it's so funny. I always think about the Twinkies, you know, that a few years ago now when they kind of announced that they were no longer making Twinkies. I, was I didn't like, know that. I've never been a big Twinkie person. I was like, damn, I got to get my hands on one of those because, you know, and I, I never was either because it wasn't accessible in my home. My parents did not believe in these like American, you know. Oh, okay. And so I was like, you know, I need to, I need to get my hands on one of those and taste that thing again. Yeah. And, and I really, I had to spit it out. I was like, really? This yeah. Is, this, is the, this is what I've been holding on to all these years. Yeah, they definitely, well, but probably from your childhood, you remember it. It doesn't, tends to not taste the same after, after a long time. Um, but I, I want to, I want to circle back to your book and because, you know, the book outlines, I don't know how many, it's like 50 or something different things yeah. that women are actually hungry for. I'm curious if there was one or one to three chapters that you keep hearing from your readers where they resonated the most with that. You know, I put perfection as number one yeah. as the first chapter. 
uh, because I feel like that's so common and shows up in so many different ways. Um, and, you know, how it undermines us. I think uh, even for myself, when I first learned or started to learn about perfectionism, I was really amazed about how it does precisely the opposite of what we're intending for it to do. Right. Uh, you know, we engage in perfectionism out of this desire to accomplish the thing really, really well. And our, and it does exactly the opposite. And I always give this, this, the example, you know, in a weight loss scenario of, okay, you decided to give up those Oreos, mm -hmm. right? And in your mind, you know, there's so many things that you want to achieve there because what's good for your body and your weight is also good for your mental and emotional exactly. health, mm -hmm. right? And so that's really important, I think, to highlight. Maybe we can circle back to that. But you also invariably have these ideas in your head, right? Like, okay, I gave up the Oreos and the red wine and the sourdough. And so at least I should be able to lose five pounds per week. And you hop on that scale and you lose four or three or two or maybe nothing. Or sometimes you gain weight. <laughs> Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And instead of being able to uh, manage our expectations and acknowledge that it's not going to go, quote, perfect the way that we foresee in our own minds, we get frustrated. We get angry with ourselves. And when that happens, invariably, we throw in the towel. And then where are you? Mm -hmm. Back at square one, mm -hmm. right? Whereas you, if we could just say to ourselves, well, shit, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That happened. That, it, that happened. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't go how I wanted it to. You're much more able to persevere in that pursuit. And this is why I love talking about food and weight loss, because it really is a mirror about two, how you are acting, how are you showing up in your life as a whole? And so if you can take that very accessible scenario, which is so accessible to all of us, it's so common, and then say, oh, wow, where am I doing this in my relationships? Where am I doing this in my work? How can I use this as an opportunity to see how I may be sabotaging myself in other areas of my life? then that relationship with food really becomes so empowering and so much more than the numbers on the scale. Mm -hmm. So I want to circle back to mental and emotional health. And I know that when we touched on it, we were talking about, you know, the things that we do to, to numb out in times of, and, you know, maybe it's not a pandemic, maybe it's just work is really stressful or kids or just all the responsibilities that, that women have, you know, career, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so what in your, you know, whether it was when you were doing research for the book or just in your years of, of practicing this and working with your patients, what have you found has been the most helpful in terms of someone working towards having, I don't know if we ever like heal it, but working towards having a better mental and emotional health? Well, I think it's, I think it's important to first acknowledge the truth that, you know, the things that are not great for our bodies are not great for our mental, emotional health either. Yes, in that moment when we eat the Oreo or the chips or whatever the case may be, there is this physiologic soothing. There's a dopamine hit. There's other neurotransmitters that are released. We feel sated and satiated and even elated mm -hmm. from consuming that thing. But, and I'm picking on your Oreos, and That's okay. You can't. They're oh, I want you to specify double stuffed. The double stuffed <laughs> Oreos. But let's say you did go into one of those moments where you had a sleeve. You know, in my mind, I remember the Thin Mints. I mean, who mm. really one Thin Mint? It was that entire sleeve. That's giving me a tummy ache now at this well, age. And, yeah. so, mm. and so there is this match, yeah, between the between the physical effect. So, you, so immediately you get that rush and it feels good. Mm -hmm. But what happens 30, 60, 90 minutes later? There is this sugar crash. Mm -hmm. What happens physiologically in a sugar crash? So we consume processed sugars that are basically, what processed sugars mean is that they're really digestible. So you get this rapid influx of sugar into the bloodstream mm -hmm. and your 
blood sugar levels peak, literally. Mm -hmm. When that happens, then your pancreas is like, holy cow, there's a lot of sugar running around here. And therefore meets that with a equally heavy surge of insulin, which of course is the hormone that helps process sugar. So then your blood sugar tanks from this surge of insulin. That delta, that change in blood sugar levels is that sugar crash, which then promotes more hunger, cravings, irritability, lethargy, tiredness, anxiety. These are true physiologic and mental emotional consequences of having that processed sugar. So I always, you know, I always ask my patients, don't, don't zone into that, that moment. We can't isolate what happens just the, in the moment that we eat the Oreos or drink that second or third glass of wine. Yes. In that moment that we feel good, but if you can zoom out and really consider what happens 30, 60, 90 minutes later, you realize that quote comfort food is not really comfortable, not mm. in your body and not in your mind. And so the consequences of these really palatable foods that were created to be super yummy <laughs> is the same in our body and in our minds. And that's important to, to notice kind mm -hmm. of the mental consequences. Yeah. The second part of that is, again, that when we use these things to soothe, and again, we talk about food because food is so very accessible, right? If you're a goody two-shoes, you're going to have a cookie. Yeah. But we could be talking about cigarettes or alcohol or right. gambling or overworking or oversexing or whatever the case may be. The bigger mental health consequence there is that the thing that is triggering you to soothe is not being addressed. It's being glossed over by whatever that thing is that we're using as our coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so if we can acknowledge that and try and put that away and really address the issue at hand, again, it is a opportunity. It's an invitation to nurture ourselves emotionally, spiritually, where we are wanting to be met. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm curious now how you help, or maybe you don't, maybe you refer them out to a specific therapist or a specific therapy. Like how do you help them find what that thing is that they're actually trying to fill? Well, usually it presents itself. You know, I mean, I just ask questions about people's lives uh, and sometimes it comes up without any prodding. You know, people will say, you know, ever since I was young, I I did X, Y, and Z around food. And then it becomes this light bulb moment where they, they've they actually vocalized it or verbalized their experience. And, and it's so clear, but it, it usually presents itself. Um, or, or they'll tell me, you know, another very common scenario is, you know, I always used to be, uh, I always exercise, I always slept really well. And then when I made partner at the firm, I've gained, you know, 10 pounds every year mm -hmm. since becoming partner. You know, the, it's clear that the overworking or the attention given to the person's work is taking away from the attention that they should be giving to themselves. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, my, my child has I'm an empty nester now. Mm -hmm. Right. And ever since my kid went away to college, I've just, it's menopause. My, yeah. my weight's been going up and yes, menopause physiologically contributes to weight gain, but we're forgetting that piece or, or it comes up that menopause coincided with empty nesting and mm -hmm. what's going on there. The fact that mothers have dedicated themselves to their children or their families to the disservice of themselves for years. Yeah. And now this child leaving the home has shown a light on years and years of self-neglect. Yeah. And, and I do refer to therapists, um, but I've also, because these stories are so universal, I've become really attuned to honing into that emotional hunger myself. I'm sure. I have found that, and again, I'm not a licensed therapist, but after doing, after coaching for so many years, 
and I'm sure this is similar for you, that I can pick up and read between the lines many times and just sort of intuitively know, you know, someone might mention that their mother passed away five years ago and they just sort of, you know, casually mention it. And then I ask them like, how's your relationship with grief? You know, how, cause you know, they think like, well, five years, this shouldn't be a thing anymore. Right. And so it's like small things like that. I think too, that people try to brush away as no big deal. And, you know, cause again, we live in a culture of pick yourself up and move on. You know, it's just like, don't complain, just brush yourself off. You'll be fine. <laughs> right. And that's not the case a lot of times. So that's interesting. I, I want to ask one of the ones that jumped out at me, and maybe this is just selfishly the one that, <laughs> that I needed to hear. It's like kind of right smack in the middle of, of the book. And it's about hungry for ease. Can you, can you speak to us about that and like sort of how that shows up with your patients? Yeah, that's so common. You know, we all need, we are all hungry for ease. I think, you know, especially these days, I feel like, um, kind of quote post pandemic, whatever that means, we're wired a little bit tight. People mm -hmm. are a little, you know, we're, we're a little intense and I feel it myself, you know, being tightly wound, um, and, and, and sometimes we just need to step back and take a deep breath and take a pause. You know, I talk about the, the science also behind quote, emotional eating. And we talk about some heavy emotional and spiritual hungers, but sometimes it's just, it's, it's very simple and, and basic, like the need for rest and play. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had this patient once who said, it's the weirdest thing. You know, I'm, I'm a breakfast person and I, eat, I like to start my day with a really healthy breakfast and I'll come and sit at my desk and within 30 minutes, I'm back in the pantry again. I don't understand. Like, I know I'm not hungry because I had, I had this really balanced breakfast and we realized that, you know, this, the uptightness around her work was really triggering you know and so are we able to just step away take a breath go out for a walk uh get a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. and allow moments of ease into our day it doesn't have to be all or nothing you know people think that in order to invite ease into their day it, it they have to go to some you know tropical vacation and that would be that lovely would be nice yeah, yeah. i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to dissuade you from doing that I, right. Book the but trip. in the absence of being able to like, you know, pack up and leave for 14 days, can you invite a little bit of ease into your day to day? And that just may be even a breathing practice, you know, mm. a pause for a deep breath or writing down your thoughts. Um, and so I think I, I'm glad you picked up on that because I think it is really common. And there's also very practical but easy to obtain ways of inviting that into your day to day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna take one more break, and when we get back, I wanted I wanted to talk to you specifically about dopamine. I'd like to introduce you to the Minimalist Moms podcast. It's hard enough being a mom, and the last thing you need is stress from too much stuff and an overcrowded schedule. For too long, I lived with the mindset that bigger was better, and the more I added to my life, instead of feeling better, I felt overwhelmed. It was time for a radical new mindset. Less is more. I'm not into extremes. I didn't throw everything away. My brand of minimalism is more about adding than subtracting. Get rid of the excess to make room for what you love. In other words, it's about living life with purpose. I hope you'll listen in and my guest and myself can inspire you to think more and do with less. The Minimalist Moms podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts. Oh, hey, everybody. It's us, Blair and Molly, your old pals from Toddler Purgatory, two moms who are also actors, who are also creative beings who sometimes feel stuck. And this is our new podcast, Unsticking It with Blair and Molly. What happens when your creative spark just seems to disappear? Gone. Poof. Bye. See ya. What happens when life gets in the way of your creativity instead of nourishing it? 
That's what happened to Molly and me. We felt like the thing that drove us creatively stopped working and impending doom had in fact impended. Totally. So we decided to do something about it. And that was steal ideas about getting unstuck from the most creative people we can find. We talk to guests about how to break through the mucky, gluey, sticky wall that can get between you and your creativity. We hear about their journeys, their successes, their challenges, and even their bougie coffee shop orders. And we're not just talking Bob Ross type paint on paper artists here, though we talk to them too. We're talking to actors, creative directors, dancers, and people who are working hard to be their best creative selves in a world that can sometimes feel real uncreative. We all have something to teach each other, so let's steal their ideas together. Join us, won't you, as we deep dive into how to unstick ourselves from the life gunk that can get in the way of our creative freedom. Pandemics, school calendars, world events, lack of sleep, oh, get out of their life gunk. And let's get back to your best creative self. Subscribe to Unsticking It with Blair and Molly. You're not going to want to miss an episode. Unsticking It with Blair and Molly, because sometimes life sucks. Unsticking It. All right, and and this isn't on my list of questions to ask you, but I I was diagnosed with ADD a, a couple of years ago, and so I've done a little bit of research on it. And and please correct me if I'm wrong, but typically people with ADD are dopamine deficient, and like the reason that we jump from thing to thing and hobby to hobby and like to plan, but don't necessarily not very good at follow through, have a hard time focusing is because we're constantly seeking out dopamine. Do you see that in, in some of your patients that like, that's really what they're hungry for and they're seeking out ways to soothe themselves that aren't actually helpful? I mean, absolutely. And let's just take a step back and without like pathologizing ourselves Mm -hmm. and just look at what we, what our, our world has become. Right. So, um, short form video. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I remember when, when I would watch like law and order, it's funny that that was one of my favorite shows, but you know, you would end on a cliffhanger and then you had to wait a freaking week episode. Right. And now fast forward to watching TV with my kids. I'm not a big TV person, but during the pandemic, we started as a family, you know, we found our favorite shows and it's really amazing for the show to end. And then you get three, two, one, and the next episode comes up, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, you're at work or at home and you get this crazy craving for uh, ice cream sandwich, and, and so you can pick up your phone and get on Uber Eats or Postmates and order it, right? Mm-hmm. Or you have this crazy idea that you want a hot pink beanie. So you get on your Amazon app yeah, and you order the beanie. So it's not even, it's not even the wanting anymore. It's the gratification. It's mm-hmm. the fact that we are so quickly gratified. And what we know about dopamine is that it's not just the desire, uh, or it's not just the thing, but it's the chase that Mm -hmm. the neurotransmitter of dopamine perpetuates the chase, right? So when things become so easily accessible, and yet you have a neurotransmitter that is not really about the pleasure of getting the thing, Mm -hmm. we really associate dopamine with the pleasure you get from eating that Oreo or getting that hot pink beanie. But it's not so much about that, but the chase. And now there is no chase. So what happens is that you keep upping the ante for the things that you want, for the things that seem pleasurable to you. Now, what also happens in regards to dopamine is that when we are constantly gratifying, those receptors, those the chemical structure of those receptors actually change in the brain such that they're dampened which means that we need more and more in order to get that emotional payoff. Mm. It's kind of a scary situation to be in a a scenario in which, you know, everything is so accessible and we can so easily gratify ourselves. And yet it's the gratification that we're seeking. And by way of doing that, we've changed the chemical nature of our brains so that it's never enough. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need to have ADHD right. mm-hmm. or anything pathological to be in that, that, you know, problem, you know, to be in that cycle. 
yeah that thank you no problem but yes that vicious cycle that we all find ourselves in it's it's interesting raising generation z a generation that does not know a life before the internet i think it would be interesting and i'm sure that they're doing research on it to see if generally speaking as a whole i guess on average if brains have changed in that way from like our parents' generation, even, even our generation where right. we had to like order stuff from a paper catalog, <laughs> like, and wait, wait, like Patient two weeks wait. yeah, <laughs> to the point where sometimes we'd forget about it if it wasn't something we were really, really wanting. And that's the thing that really worries me the most. I mean, yes, I, I don't love access to certain types of content or information, mm -hmm. but I feel like I've, I have three kids and I think I've, you know, I've done my best, let's put it yeah. that way, mm -hmm. to raise them and to know what they should be seeking or looking at or be discerning about their news and information. What I worry, though, is is them being used to having access, mm -hmm. you know, and and what that does to their ability to be patient and yeah. to understand that not everything has to and should come to us quickly mm -hmm. and act quickly and easily. on it on demand. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I, I, I want to, before I let you go, I want to ask you about another chapter that jumped out at me and that is ritual. I, it, that's something I don't think gets talked about enough, you know, especially kind of dovetailing off this conversation that we just had about how quick and easy things are. I think ritual has become, I don't know, for lack of a better expression, like a lost art. So talk yeah. to, talk to us about how you view, view ritual and why it's so important. Well, you know, in, in doing the research for this chapter, Hungry for Ritual, I was exploring some of the religious faiths and I was remembering back to my own school days. We're not religious, we're very traditional, mm -hmm. but I did go to a Jewish day school and I remember we used to have to do a singy song prayer before we ate a singy mm -hmm. song prayer afterwards. And again, I don't do that in my day-to-day -day life, but I came to understand the beauty and the value of what that does. You know, having that ritual of prayer before and after meals invites pause, uh, right? It invites mindfulness, this opportunity to really use mealtime as a sacred time, mm -hmm. as opposed to, and, and to use, to see food as something sacred, as opposed to something that we shove in our mouths while we're driving or walking from point A to point B, where we're really not giving the necessary respect to the food and to ourselves. Right. And so that's just one aspect of ritual that is so beautiful because it, it invites mindfulness, but also this level of appreciation for the time and the space of mealtime, for the food that we're about to consume, and for our own bodies. Mm -hmm. I found it to be really beautiful, again, circling back to women's circles, and not even necessarily during during mealtime, but just you know, the ritual of, of, you know, taking some deep breaths before everybody shares whatever vulnerable thing they're going to share, or just these like small things that, that can make such a difference to bring people together in community of kind of doing this shared thing together. And reading that chapter made me think that how much I really do enjoy having ritual in my personal life, like with just me, you know, whether it's journaling and, and burning it, I have like a little mini cauldron made out of cast iron. It's a little bit witchy, but it's small and it's just for safety, like really, <laughs> but things like that. So that was, that was one of, one of the, my favorite chapters. I want to ask you, know, you Andrea, ritual, uh, sorry, I just ritual also, it, I feel like it's the other side of the coin to routine. Okay. Say more about and that. And one of the things that really happened during the pandemic that we haven't completely, I think, wrapped our arms around is the loss of ritual and routine in our day. Um, there, there's a lot of value that has come from learning how to work differently, work from home. And one of the things I loved personally living on, in Los Angeles was not having that drive and the traffic to deal with, right? But I realized that that drive actually 
was part of the day. It created bookends, a beginning and an end, mm. without which we had to create our own routine, a lot of which was, you know, the five o'clock happy hour, you know, everybody yeah. woke up, right? And and that was replacing something that, a routine that kind of created this, again, beginning and end. Mm -hmm. um, and we've lost that in these different, these new work ways that are celebrated. I love that we are thinking outside of the box in terms of how we're living our lives, but but routine and ritual is important. And without it, we create maladaptive ways of coping. Mm. And so I want people to look at how their routines changed, not having to get up and go to the gym. Does that mean we no longer invite movement into our lives? Um, watching Netflix late at night because we know we don't have to wake up early the next morning. Are we now cutting into that nutrient of sleep? Where has routine and ritual been lacking in our own lives leading to maladaptive behaviors that aren't serving us? Yeah. Thank you for adding that on. That's, that's, it's really something to think about. I have loved this conversation so much. I want to just ask you before we go, is there anything you want to circle back to, or really any of the chapters that we didn't get to talk about? There's so many that we didn't get to, to talk about. And by the way, everyone, the book is called Hungry for More. The link will be in the show description. Anything you want to add before we go in order for you to feel complete? Well, I I think the that I did a TED talk several months ago that's mm -hmm. on my website, uh, dradrianudim.com, and I think that is um, a twelve minute kind of overview of what I'm trying to share in this book, and I think it's really important. I to your point at the beginning of the conversation, I named this book "Hungry for More: Stories and Science to Inspire Weight Loss." And I use weight loss just because it is such a common hook that mm -hmm. we think about, but it really is just a hook. And I think that the ideas are so much more broadly yeah. um, applied. And so the, the talk does give, I think, a flavor of what I'm trying to relay in the book. And so I would love for people to, to watch and to use that as a springboard to identify what it is that they're really hungry for. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. And we'll have that link to your TED talk in the show notes as well. And is there anywhere that you want to send people specifically? I know that you mentioned your website, um, but is there anywhere you want people to go to learn more about your work? Well, I'm also on Instagram at Dr. Adrian Udine, where I share almost daily musings. Um, and so you can find me there and communicate with me as well. I love to hear DMs of people who've read the book and um, I man it myself. So I like to respond. Awesome. And, yeah. Okay. We'll make sure that that's in the show description as well. Everyone, thank you so much for your time. You know how much I appreciate you and I'm grateful that you're here. Thank you, Dr. Adrian. It's been so amazing to connect with you. Likewise. It was a lovely conversation and I really appreciate your time. Yeah, well. my pleasure. And everyone listening, uh, remember it's our life's journey to make ourselves better humans and our life's responsibility to make the world a better place. Bye for now. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. I would be so incredibly grateful if you haven't done so already, if you could leave a review of this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Super easy if you already listen to your shows over there. Um, but if you don't, or maybe you have the app on your phone, but you listen to the show on a different app, if you could leave a review for this show, it matters so much. I wish I could express how much it matters. I also wish that it didn't matter so much, but alas, it does. So if you haven't already, please go review and rate the show. It would mean so much to me. And thank you so much. I hope you have an amazing day. Hey there, I'm Debbie Reber, the founder of Tilt Parenting and the author of the book, Differently Wired. The mission of Tilt is to change the way neurodivergence, whether that's having a learning disability, having ADHD, being gifted, autistic, or some combination of all of the above, 
is perceived and experienced so differently wired kids and the parents like us raising them can truly thrive. On the Tilt Parenting Podcast, I get to talk with authors, therapists, educators, and parenting experts who are committed to this mission. I ask the questions my listeners are most curious about when it comes to supporting our kids. And in turn, my guests share strategies for challenges, out-of-the-box ideas for navigating school, best practices for therapies, tips for advocating, and so many thoughtful insights on what it really takes to help our kids grow up feeling seen and respected so they can create awesome lives for themselves. I know that raising a differently wired kid can feel overwhelming and isolating, but I promise you, you are not alone and it can feel so much better. If you're on this parenting journey, come listen to Tilt Parenting. Together, we can shift this paradigm and show up for our exceptional kids with hope, possibility, and joy.